That's interesting because DHT is also something that's usually frowned upon because people consider it the thing that causes hair loss. Correct. And they obviate the fact that, or they ignore the fact that it's four times more anabolic than testosterone. DHT is not four times more anabolic than testosterone. What's up, guys? Derek, more plates, more leads.com. Today, we are going to be reacting to the podcast that came out the other day with uh, Dr. Mark Gordon and Andrew Marr. So, a lot of you guys sent this to me, and I can see why there was a lot of talk about uh, um, DHT, muscle growth, HPTA, you know, uh, testosterone suppression, testosterone replacement, um, bioidentical hormone replacement, just in general, broad spectrum, a lot of fucking shit. So we're going to get into this. This might end up being a few different videos, like split into different topics, because to not get pinged by the copyright system, these have to be separated into like... 10, 11 second intervals, just so you know. So it's kind of like, I'm gonna have to have commentary every 10 seconds and it's gonna be very difficult to do. So you just like, bear with me. That's just how it works. If you go over like 11 seconds of a, something that is gonna, you know, copyright hit or something, you end up having to, uh, you just can't do it. If you go over, you, you might get, uh, you know, dinged and demonetized by the person who uploaded it, even if it is fair use. So anyway, you know, prepare for that uh, excessive interjections, but um, that's just how it works. So we're gonna see, I'm gonna try and probably do this video as just the DHT component, and then I'll probably get into the HPTA stuff in the next one, but like there's a lot of stuff to cover here, and in 10 second intervals, it's gonna be hard. So let's see how we can do it from here. So the first thing I wanted to touch on is, this is the timestamp everyone told me to go to, it was around the 44 minute mark, and basically going into the talk of DHT, he starts by saying how DHEA pretty much dictates of DHT gets into the cell and then determines, I'll, I'll let him say it. I might have to interject in between though. And another issue with vitamin D, is, I mean with uh, DHEA, is DHEA is important for allowing DHT, dihydrotestosterone, into the cell. And why is that important? So, Okay, hang on. DHT is a byproduct of testosterone because it's the combination of DHEA getting DHT, dihydrotestosterone in the cell that allows for sugar to be brought into the myocytes. In so, you know, typically the way we all understand how androgens induce their effects is through the androgen receptor primarily and then through satellite interactions with other receptors. But to say DHEA is responsible for DHT getting into the cells, which then, and then implying that muscle growth is a consequence of, or like a benefit byproduct of adequate DHEA and concurrently DHT levels is just ridiculous because DHT literally has almost no benefit whatsoever for muscle growth. And we've seen this clinically proven many times, and I will get into that shortly. Into the muscle cells. So there are articles out there talking about if you want to get the optimal benefit for muscle growth, you need to make sure your DHEA levels are optimal. So yeah, DHEA, you know, it's an important precursor in the steroidogenesis cascade to create many different uh, things in the body, including all of the aromatization into estrogens, you know, we have DHEA, you know, goes into testosterone and goes into estrone as a byproduct of testosterone, goes into estradiol, blah, blah, blah. If you go up the steroidogenesis cascade, you can see what turns into DHEA as a result of that, what goes down and then eventually becomes testosterone and DHT or gets aromatized into some sort of estrogen, whether it be estrone, estradiol, and then estriol. But there's no, to s how many guys are going to be like severely DHEA deficient in their youth, like for him to imply that it has some major regulating mechanism on muscle growth is kind of ridiculous to me when all of the clinical studies show like no performance enhancing benefit whatsoever in men. Mm. To get the DHT to increase glycogen in the muscle cells. So use that for energy and for growth. That's yeah. So it's like, what is going to dictate muscle growth, glycogen retention, all of these things, nitrogen retention, protein accretion, blah, blah, blah. Like what is going to run determine most of the, these factors in the body, is it going to be the androgenicity component? That is basically the thing that balances out estrogenic activity in certain tissues or develops secondary sexual characteristics, things of this nature. No, like it, it, clinically we do not see DHT have any major role on muscle growth. And we can see this when you nuke it to zero, it has no net impact whatsoever. So it's interesting because DHT is also something that's usually frowned upon because people consider it the thing that causes hair loss. 
Correct. Yeah, so people commonly think it's the thing that causes hair loss, and despite the fact that it is only found in a fraction of the amount that testosterone is in the body through 5-alpha reduction, it is significantly more androgenic, has a much more problematic binding affinity, constant dissociation rate. Everything about it is just much worse, and it is also very tissue specific in that you have a significant amount of 5-alpha reductase activity right here. You know, so it's something that is basically the primary way that you cause androgenic alopecia is DHC. Yes, that is true. However, it's not the only thing. It's just another androgen. It's just a more problematic androgen. And we all know, if you've watched my stuff at this point, that it is free androgens are the main reason of hair loss. I'm not going to say cause hair loss because obviously there is a cascade of events that occurs as a result of all of the processes around androgen binding to AR, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, obviously the androgen itself doesn't literally just like flamethrower your fucking hair follicle. But um, yeah, it's all androgens. It's not just DHT. And yeah, it is, in general, it is the main problematic hormone though. And they obviate the fact that, or they ignore the fact that it's four times more anabolic than testosterone. So this is the thing I had the major issue with. He said it's, did he say four times more anabolic than testosterone? Like, I couldn't even believe my ears when I first went through this the first time. DHT is not four times more anabolic than testosterone. Maybe he's thinking he's saying androgenic, and he means, but he, he is not able to differentiate between androgen, androgenicity and ab, anabolic activity in his head. But here is the study I want to refer to. So this is an article I wrote a while ago. Frankly, it needs updating, but it doesn't really matter. This part is completely accurate. Muscle loss caused by finasteride. This is where I was addressing 5-alpha reductase blockade, and if there was going to be any kind of impact on muscle growth whatsoever. So in the following study, using dutasteride, which is a far more DHT-suppressive compound than finasteride, wipes out 5-AR1, 2, 3, literally inhibit your DHT by 99% versus ProScar at a 5-milligram dose, you're only going to get 70% inhibition at best. And for guys using 1.25 milligrams or 1 milligram, you know, you might get a little bit less than that. But at the end of the day, if we want to see what actually happens when you inhibit 5-AR with muscle growth, we use dutasteride to really see what's going on because we're nuking DHT to nothing. So if indeed this is four times more androg anabolic, see, I'm like, I can't even say it the wrong way because of the, how fucking wrong it sounds in my head. If it was indeed four times more anabolic than testosterone, we would see a massive loss in muscle when we, you know, deplete it to nothing. So here we see nearly wiping out participants' DHT levels with dutasteride. They did not experience hindered muscle growth at all in response to, gr to graded testosterone doses. The DHT-deprived group had no significant disadvantage to the group that wasn't using dutasteride. So you can see here, conclusions, changes in fat-free mass in response to graded testosterone doses did not differ in men whom DHT was suppressed by dutasteride from those treated with placebo, in indicating that conversion of testosterone to DHT is not essential for mediating its anabolic effects on muscle. In addition, when you look at pseudohermaphrodites in teenagehood, when they are literally going through puberty, you have these guys with 5-alpha reductase mutations. So things that are literally inhibiting the proper expression of a gene in the body that encodes for 5-AR. So these guys, they don't have a functioning 5-alpha reductase enzyme that can convert T to DHT. So what they have as a result of that is significantly, well, not significantly, but like, you know, a, a decent amount higher total testosterone levels and no DHT. So as a result, what happens is they end up with micro penis, less hair loss, not as much facial hair growth or body hair growth, basically exactly what you'd expect from a DHT deprived kid. It's like a, like a middle ground between like castration and like not. So they still like develop into men, develop penises. They're micro though. They don't have the DHT that then progresses and develops, you know, secondary sexual characteristics and really gets them to full maturation. So they end up with this kind of like middle of the ground. They look like men. They are men, but they have like halfway developed like features. However, the one thing they don't have is less muscle mass. So what you see here is the male on the left and the male in the center are pseudo hermaphrodites and are cousins. So these guys have 5-alpha reductase mutations in the gene that encodes for 5-AR. So they end up with no DHT at all. So the result of that is, and the male on the right is a normal male and the brother of the affected male on the left. So these two are brothers. This guy is 5-AR deficient. This guy has all of his DHT intact and he went through puberty properly. 
the affected males, aka the ones with no DHT, are more muscular, whereas the normal male has a beard and temporal hairline recession. So, not only does this guy have hair loss, but he's less jacked than the guy who's a pseudo-hermaphrodite with a micropenis, probably. So that's not, <laughs> that's not to say that you should go about inducing this state in puberty. That would be a horrible idea, and it's the last thing you want to do. Even if you were experiencing hair loss in your puberty phase, I would advise significantly against finasteride use during that time frame, because that is where you can actually hinder your development pretty significantly. But this literally proves that it's not the fucking anabolic hormone. It is the androgenic hormone that does absolutely nothing for your muscle growth. Now, you could obviously make the argument that down the line, sure, your motor unit recruitment in the gym could be, you know, not as good without the DHT component. So therefore, you're going to have much worse like neurological efficiency and inability to push as much weight and downstream consequence could be less muscle growth, maybe. But clinically, we don't see that at all. And in fact, you see from day one, these guys who have 5AR deficiencies actually end up more muscular than the guy who has his DHT. So no, this is completely shit. It's just like, first of all, four times more anabolic. That's completely untrue. And then if we want to get into how important is DHT for muscle growth, absolutely not at all, to be honest. Maybe, okay, in the more like hyper niche scenario where a guy has like super high SHBG and like super high estrogen. So therefore, if you add more DHT it would occupy more SHBG and free up more T, which as a consequence would allow you to have a better T to E ratio and, you know, maybe allow you to gain more muscle in that. You, the, you could argue like really get in depth if you wanted to. But at the end of the day, in general, this is what is the fucking deal. And DHT is not going to have a significant impact net impact at the end of the day on your muscle growth at all. And you don't have to have the levels of DHT to induce hair loss. You can have just in the 50th percentile of the range. Well, I was taking... Uh... So that is 100% true. So him saying you don't need to have high DHT levels to experience hair loss, first of all, it's going to be your free DHT levels that dictate what is actually going around and fucking you up. Because like DHT bound to SHBG, it's not really going to be like going and binding to the AR and transcribing its effects in the tissue when it is being bound up and basically balanced out with the estrogenicity in your body. So DHT has a five times higher binding affinity for SHBG than testosterone and a multiple fold higher binding affinity for SHBG than estrogen. So it's your free DHT at the end of the day that is the problem. And, and, and still, that's a tissue specific level. So we can't just use blood as a proxy for, oh, your scalp therefore has this much of an issue because your blood shows this like that's not exactly how it works there probably is some sort of intrinsic you know factors that have to do with how certain like uh you know negative i don't know like feedback systems in the actual hair follicle area in your actual scalp determine how much is five alpha reduced into D dht and how much you know signaling you get or how much expression you get from the AR and things of this nature but like it's not a coincidence that women when they have you know PCOS or you know insulin resistance or whatever if you have like high like women can experience androgenic alopecia with as low as like 100 nanogram per deciliter test levels even less than that you know it's uh it's not very hard to induce androgenic alopecia if you're prone like even if you're on the very low end of the hypogonadal spectrum and you had a 250 it's not impossible to get androgenic alopecia. Like there are chicks that get androgenic alopecia all the time with relatively normal levels. Now, I'm, okay, that is misleading to say all the time, but I mean like in a unhealthy state where they're, you know, crushing their SHBG or inducing or have some sort of, you know, clinical, you know, issue that results in them having a higher testosterone level like the PCOS example, this kind of stuff causes like viralization, can develop androgenic alopecia with levels like, several times lower than what a male who has shitty like 80 year old man production would be producing. So their testosterone, like, you know, being high as a consequence, obviously that leads to more five alpha reduction into DHT. So that's basically what I mean by that. Uh, Propecia for a while. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how much it was fucking me up until yep. I, my prescription ran out. Like I was just accustomed to it. And then all of a sudden uh, I had way more energy and rah, 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 rah. Okay. So basically, you know, erection quality goes up, energy went up, libido went up. So inhibition of DHT is going to affect everyone differently because at the end of the day, your hormone levels, like you have a certain amount of androgens to rely on for physiologic functions. And if you are inhibiting the main androgenic hormone in your body by upwards of 70%, and let's say hypothetically simultaneously, you have like a relatively low-ish 
total and free T, like not that good of testosterone production, your hormone that is the most androgenic that you were literally depending like very, very heavily on for dictating all of these functions, erectile quality, neurological processes, blah, 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 that kind of shit. If all of a sudden you take that hormone and then you slash it by 70% and you have like a pretty subpar testosterone, testosterone level to begin with, you're now relying on like all your dick function with like 20 to 30% of your DHT which might be subpar to begin with because of your low T and then like a relatively like moderate or shitty testosterone level. And you're basically trying to, hey, you might've been hanging on for dear life previously and been like borderline, you know, like having a uh, hypogonadal symptoms, like you never know. Or you could just be on the borderline of like the further down the spectrum you go, the worse off you likely will be. You know, it's not a coincidence that you're more likely to get ED at a 300 nanogram per deciliter total than you are at 800, for example. So, you know, when you crush your DHT, now you're relying way more heavily on your testosterone. And if that is not on point, you know, you could be definitely notice a, a substantial difference. Right. And uh, I was like, what is going on here? Like, yep. what's, and then I realized, oh my God, I'm poisoning myself. Yep. Yeah. Yes. But other people don't have that reaction, apparently. Um, Some people don't have a problem with it. Yeah. Yeah, so some most people won't have a problem with it or the problem is so minuscule it's imperceivable. However, like he said, he got used to it and then when he came off, he noticed a big difference. So some people who don't notice the difference, they notice it once they get off. And I'm not trying to say that you won't notice it. Like in fact, it is very likely you'll have, you know, perhaps some inhibition in erectile quality, perhaps your um, neurological health will slightly degrade. Your fertility certainly won't be as good with a 70% slash in your DHT. There are a lot of things in the body that are not going to be as on point without your DHT there. What do you expect? You're pretty much inducing a state of like mild pseudo hermaphroditism. Like that, like that's what you're fucking doing. You're taking a giant chunk of your androgen index and fucking slashing it out of your body. So Yes, that is an expected outcome and it is honestly the price you may pay when you use a drug intended to deplete the most androgenic hormone in your body. So no one is trying to, well, there are, you know, some people will say there's no chance of side effects. It's all placebo, blah, blah, blah. And then some people will say it's like the most poison drug ever and it'll fuck you up and ruin your life. The truth is in the middle. Some people will get away unscathed and oftentimes the majority of individuals will have an imperceivable difference in their state of, you know, quality of life functionality in general, blah, 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 overall health parameters. But then there's going to be some, you know, a minority of individuals who notice some difference. And then like an even smaller minority of individuals who notice a massive difference to the point that it's significantly impeding their quality of life, mental health, etc. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. The post finasteride Foundation or post finasteride Syndrome Foundation, uh, we're in the top of uh, providers of care because <clears throat> the problem that happens from finasteride Okay, so he's about to talk about post finasteride syndrome, which is the thing I was just referring to as, you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle. There are going to be the people who fear monger it, and then there's going to be the people who say, don't listen to the post finasteride guys. It's total bullshit. And it's like, the truth is in the middle. It's not the say, it's not anything. If you're inhibiting an enzymatic process in the body that's supposed to be happening, expecting that there's going to be zero net, like negative impact at all is kind of like, it's there for a fucking reason, you know? It's not like you just, you're, you're, 5AR would shut off after puberty if indeed it was only there to regulate your dick getting to full size. You know what I mean? Right. Is that it inhibits two very important pathways in the brain. One that gives you the ability to grow muscles, the other one which is emotional. So no, it doesn't impact your ability to grow muscles at all. It's completely wrong. The emotional component though, yes, I can totally get on board with because it does indeed have a big inhibition component on 5AR, not only to create DHT, but upstream in the steroidogenesis cascade to create neurosteroids that are very anxiolytic. I always have a hard time saying that. Like anti-anxiety, um, anti-depression, you know, uh, pro, you know, sleep, relaxation, pro libido, a lot of things that are going to be modulated, not directly through DHT, but upstream in that conversion of, you know, pregnenolone downstream to allopregnenolone and things like this. So traditionally, um, the approach for treating the side effects has been just improving DHT because the Propecia, what's the other name? Uh, it's all finasteride. Yeah, it's a Propecia brand name for finasteride for your hair. You know, it's the uh, brand one milligram branded tablet. Proscar, five milligram branded tablet for benign prostatic hyperplasia. A lot of time people for cost effective purposes will take a Proscar five milligram tablet, split it into quarters, end up with 1.25 milligram quarters of a Proscar tablet, and then use that as their makeshift Propecia, which in reality is just a 
0.25 milligram stronger version of the one milligram tablet because you now have a 1.25 milligram quarter that costs you a fraction of the price. And as far as treatment methods for post syndrome, he mentioned how increasing DHT levels is one. So that is something I used to think like when you finish you're taking your finasteride and you stop it, hypothetically, if you had side effects. Again, the chance that you're gonna experience side effects is lower than you just, you know, having no perceivable difference at all. However, the majority of individuals with side effects upon discontinuation of the drug will have 5-alpha reductase enzymes restore themselves once your body's, you know, physiologic processes reach homeostasis. Not only that you've cleared the drug out of the system half-life wise, but also that you've had a chance to essentially not recycle, but like produce enough 5-AR again that can then produce that 5-alpha reduction into DHT, the neurosteroids, etc. And most people will reach like their baseline, you know, hormonal state pretty easily and not be affected long-term. But there are individuals who then have like holes essentially in their neurosteroid production or potentially downstream in their balance of free androgens to free estrogens and things of this nature. And some individuals have been on the drug for so long that eventually by the time they get off, their hormone production would have declined significantly anyway. So they end up at a baseline profile that is no longer representative of their baseline state when they started the drug. Cause it's like, you know, 10 years later or something and their T levels have declined by blank percentage as well as their DHT. So they would have ended up in like hypogonadal symptom territory anyways. So the majority of people will experience symptom relief simply by discontinuation when 5-AR has come back fully online and they can then 5-alpha reduce the testosterone into enough DHT to kind of fill the void of the androgenic activity that was causing the issues in the first place. But again, there are the niche, very specific scenarios where individuals that is not sufficient and or they aren't able to reach a baseline state because of age, lifestyle, body composition even if you're too fat and you have too much negative feedback from over aromatizing into estrogen hitting your hbta not producing enough testosterone as a byproduct you have low t low dht blah 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 there's a myriad of different issues proscards finasteride is the chemical finasteride blocks the conversion of testosterone to dht and as i just said dht is four times more anabolic than testosterone total horse shit stop saying it do people take DHT as a supplement? You, you take testosterone or you take uh, DHEA, which will generate testosterone to generate DHT. Oh, okay. So clinically, when you look up DHEA supplementation in healthy men, what happens? Fucking nothing, dude. It does almost absolutely nothing to increase T levels whatsoever. So even though upstream on the steroidogenesis pathway, you can clearly see DHEA goes downstream into testosterone. When you take DHEA, even a high dose, dude, it has a negligible impact on T levels, like very, very minimal, almost like imperceivable. Actually, if I recall correctly, there was no difference at all. Like it is more effective in women for increasing T levels than it is in guys. So no, taking DHEA won't solve your issue unless you were like DHEA deficient and that was your only problem. And using literal DHT, fuck dude. Like I got that, that if you were DHT deficient, you wanted to go like straight to the source. That could work, but then you're also causing suppression through negative feedback to your HPTA from binding to the AR and then shutting yourself down and essentially ending up on a makeshift HRT regimen of DHT with no estrogen there or testosterone and fucking yourself up even more. So no, that's a, both are terrible ideas. But DHT in our brain is what gives us our energy, our libido, our activity level, our cognition to some degree. And then another pathway, which has totally been ignored is the one where the five alpha Okay, sorry, I had to interrupt him there because of the uh, time. Finishing the sentence probably would have been 15 seconds, and we all know with the uh, copyright system, that's a bit too risky. So here I am talking about how him saying DHT is what regulates energy levels. He said a little bit, so that's like, that's fair um, to say that that's part of the reason you can have your get up and go and motivation, blah, blah, blah. It certainly plays a role in that. Reductase, which is the enzyme that the uh, propecia of finasteride kills is important for generating something called allopregnanolone. Yeah, so that is the downstream neurosteroid that has the most focus in terms of its deprivation in post-finasteride syndrome sufferers, and rightly so, because it is one of the main um, problems with people with post-finasteride syndrome, in my opinion, too, from all the research I've seen. From pregnenolone. Allopregnanolone just came out as a drug last year, or excuse me, two years ago for $34,000 a year called um, bricks analone. Yeah, so it's a super expensive thing being produced now and it's, you know, being uh, postpartum depression for treatment of that. And this is largely 
why people speculate, you know, women in pregnancy can have, uh, like the downstream creation of uh, allopregnenolone can be a strong modulator of their libido, sense of well-being, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, in post-finasteride syndrome patients, their uh, allopregnenolone levels are often, like the people with chronic issues who have normal, good, you know, balance of free androgens to free estrogens, and they still have the exact same issues. They're like super anxious, they can't sleep, they're, uh, you know, randomly depressed, they have, you know, poor libido, blah, 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 erectile dysfunction. This is where looking upstream at that cascade can then have you know, be, be a very viable and like smart thing to do because it may indeed be something to do with perhaps either allopregnenolone, TH doc, any of these neurosteroid cascade results that then have a strong impact on terms of how you feel on a regular basis and your quality of life and how you perceive the world around you. And brixanolone is being used for anti-depression, anti-anxiety, and postpartum depression which tells us how important pregnenolone is to become progesterone, to become this thing called allopregnanolone and giving you mental stability. Yeah, so guys who are shutting themselves down on TRT, this is something that Leo and Longevity and I talked about at length before. Actually, we were talking about, um, I think it was like TSPO um, agonist as far as the rate limiting steps in the neurosteroid cascades. In addition to that though, we were talking more primarily about progesterone supplementation in guys who are on TRT because when you have HPTA suppression, you know, you often are going to find a lack of adequate neurosteroid production through the same cascade that is sort of downregulated when you introduce exogenous androgens into the equation. So I believe progesterone also upregulates steroidogenic acute regulatory protein, which is kind of the main thing theorized to be responsible for the steroidogenesis cascade to begin with from the base cholesterol. So when you use something like progesterone, which you may otherwise be deficient in when you're on HRT, this can have a strong positive influence on sense of well-being, quality of life, blah, blah, blah. I, I actually use progesterone with my TRT now, by the way. I think I mentioned that a while ago, but if you didn't know, I do. So anyway, <laughs> but for guys who aren't on HRT, using exogenous progesterone to treat post-finasteride syndrome, while it may upstream deal with some of the issues that are kind of like, there's like holes in the system essentially, you're going to provide negative feedback, which can then downregulate your HPTA if you're natural and then suppress other androgens being produced, which is then obviously very problematic. So that is where the intervening with something that is more broad spectrum to treat post finasteride syndrome makes a lot more sense. And this is where I've seen great success with exogenous HCG administration for, you know, perhaps 150 to 250 IU every other day. It seems to be a very, very positive um, net result for the majority of individuals and seems to rectify the issue for most people. And um, obviously this is something that also will suppress your HPTA. But however, the good thing about it is it's broad spectrum in that it takes care of the entire steroidogenesis cascade rather than just hitting one specific area and then like dealing with deficiencies all over the fucking place. It kind of takes care of everything, waits until everything reaches uh, homeostasis and then you can kind of discontinue it. I'm not saying to do it. I'm just saying I've seen success in individuals anecdotally who have tried it and seems to be a very uh, promising therapy. Obviously you could use a more targeted approach right at that part of the steroidogenesis cascade with certain things that modulate the production of allopregnenolone and whatnot, but it kind of depends on your funds, what you have access to, what you're willing to do to yourself, um, who's overseeing you, because this is shit you should not be doing without a doctor, obviously. And um, yeah, anyway. So what happens is inflammation that we see in our head trauma cases, it disrupts that pregnenolone, which is also called the mother of all hormones. Yeah, so obviously inflammation, stress, et cetera, is all going to lower your testosterone production, lower your endogenous androgen and neurosteroid production. That would be an expected outcome. Because it gives rise to all our hormones. Assuming that's what he's talking about. That's what I think he's talking about. So you should supplement with that as well. Supplement with pregnenolone. How much uh, pregnenolone? Oh, we use 100 milligrams after uh dinner now because so he's suggesting everyone to supplement with 100 milligrams of pregnenolone which seems absolutely fucking like very haphazard bad advice like i would not be telling a guy who otherwise has healthy endogenous production of hormones to take exogenous anything so to say you just should take pregnenolone for the sake of because maybe in a pregnenolone deficient individual or somebody who was chronically stressed and otherwise was deficient in that it in that hormone that you should just fucking take it like no dude like address the root of the issue don't just slap on 
it's like telling a guy like, oh, you feel, you know, shitty, you feel low T, get on TRT, like and not even look at perhaps rectifying it naturally first. So I don't know if that was advice for everyone or if like that was kind of baffling to me because I would not just be like, hey dude, everyone take 100 milligrams pregnenolone, everyone take DHEA, like fuck no, dude. That's like literally me saying like, hey dude, like go inject testosterone just because. It's fat soluble. It's so fat soluble. once a day, 100 milligrams. Correct. And how much DHEA? Uh, DHEA, we started at 25 and we take DHEA at nighttime. Not at okay, when he says we, I think he's probably talking about like his patients then. So like what I just said about 100 milligrams pregnenolone, presumably he's not saying to do that for everyone. So this should be clear. Hopefully that is what he meant. Don't go just randomly taking pregnenolone DHEA thinking you need it for immune response. Because if you're not deficient, you probably don't need it. In the morning, like a lot are saying, the reason for taking it at night, it has a side effect of upregulating growth hormone production by, by up to 15%. So, so he's saying take DHEA at night because it upregulates growth hormone production? Like personally, I would not do that. I would never take anything androgen related right before bed as it can enhance sympathetic drive and then prevent you from getting to sleep as well. In my opinion, I would never take... Even like your testosterone injection, I would advise taking it away from bedtime, as far away as possible. I don't want a big bolus of fucking androgens in my system or precursors to androgens before I go to sleep. That's the last thing I want. I'm trying to relax. I'm trying to get into a parasympathetic, relaxed, rest and digest state. I don't want any fucking androgens. No thanks, dude. So if you take it based upon... Some people will even say don't take vitamin D at nighttime for that same reason. The biological clock in the body, you can get benefits in other areas, not just DHEA. I could be totally wrong though, by the way. This is just me saying my own opinion. DHEA also helps stabilize glucose and insulin interaction, stimulates the immune system, wound healing, and drops inflammation. That's below the, uh, the neck. Okay, so I think we're pretty much at the end of the discussion of finasteride, DHT, post finasteride syndrome, etc. And I think that is sufficient because this video is pushing 35 minutes. If there is more parts of this you want me to cover, let me know in the comments down below. I might skim through. There was a part about HP, HPTA and clomid use that I think I'll probably make a video on. If there's any other parts specifically you want me to touch on, let me know because it's a long... This is over two hours, dude. So for me to go through this, I probably don't even have time to listen to the full thing, to be honest. So if there is any parts you want me to touch on and make a video about, let me know. But otherwise, that is the, uh, the for part one. So let me know. Uh, drop a comment. Helps the algorithm. Um, like helps the algorithm too. Uh, subscribe helps grow the channel. <laughs> Um, if you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below my TRT clinic, notably that has PCCs and doctors who know how to interpret stuff like this. And, um, I've honestly handpicked many of our PCCs based on the knowledge they have on topics exactly like this. So you're definitely in good hands with them. Um, it's all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home. I and mean, if you want to support the channel too, you know, Gorilla Mind, Nootropic formulas, Gorilla Mode, pre-workout formulas that design myself from scratch. And anything else I'm associated with, it's all in the video description below. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Actually, it too. Also, uh, follow me on Instagram. I'm more points underscore more dates. I forgot to do the socials plugs. Facebook, Snapchat, Bitchu, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. I'm also on Parlor now as well. I don't know if that's going to be a big platform or not, but uh, I'm taking the time to post there. So follow me there if you're there. So thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.